<clears throat> chapter 6 is a really interesting chapter. Um, it's, it's, Paul doesn't pull any punches. Um, he's fairly explicit in some of the things he talks about. He's fairly passionate in how he's addressing his friends in the Corinthian church. And so, as we, as we look through it this morning, um, I think we're going to be surprised at what, what he put in there. You are what you eat. How many have heard that before? You are what you eat. And uh, it's a phrase that's been around for some time. It's supposed to encourage us um, to eat healthy and to be mindful of what we're putting in our body. Apparently what we put into our body has significant effect. And uh, we have a balanced diet. If your idea of a balanced diet is a Coke in one hand, a pizza in the other, and a bowl of chips in your knees, you, there might be an issue. I, n I remember when I was in my early adulthood, for a brief period of time, I thought that the four food groups were boxed, bottled, canned, and bagged. <laughs> but apparently that's not true. So we have this phrase, this idiom, you are what you eat. And there's a certain amount of truth in it. A spiritual parallel to that might be, you are what you think. You are what you, th what you think. Not you are what you think you are. That's a little different. But you are what you think. Because ideas have consequences. Ideas have consequences. And our thought patterns set the course for our life, whether we are aware of it or not. And these words and phrases and repetitive sentences that run around in our heads, whether we intend them to or not, they define us and point us in a direction. Oftentimes we don't even realize that we're going that way. And we each have them. We each have these phrases that are running in our head. So what was the phrase that ran around in your head when you looked into the mirror this morning? First thing, you get up, go to the bathroom, and look at the mirror. Some of you might have thought, wow, i made in the image of God and I am of infinite worth. It might have just been, wow, I hope we can do something with this. <laughs> but there's this phrase in our head. These things that run around in our, in our minds. And the Corinthian Christians were no different than us. There are some common phrases and idioms in, in, in the culture that were affecting them. They were having actually a devastating effect on their Christian lives. Because they were helping them and they, they were wrong ideas. They were wrong thought patterns. They were lies. And they were being repeated in their mind over and over and over. So the Apostle Paul was he was teaching them. And he recognized, as we have, as we've studied the, the letter so far, that these Christians were immature and they were self-indulgent. Now that was tearing the church apart. There were divisions and quarrels and strife. And it was really bringing disgrace to the name of Jesus. And so Paul, in this chapter, he identifies some of these common idioms and, and mantras. And, and it's really interesting to watch them divide them with the word of truth and just expose them this is what they are you see the Corinthians had not progressed in their faith to where Paul thought they should be he, where he expected them to be they were immature and they would either forgotten what they had been taught or they hadn't learned it in the first place hadn't learned some of the basic lessons in following Jesus and I think mostly it had to do with their identity in Christ and so we can learn from this chapter, even if we've been a disciple of Christ for many years, even for a short time, we need to be reminded, perhaps even instructed for the first time, of who we are in Christ. What happened when we got saved? What, we, what have we been saved from? What, what are we saved to? We're a forgetful people. We need reminders constantly. Some of us more than others. But we need reminders, don't we? And I'm so grateful for the Lord's Supper communion 
that we're privileged to share this morning because it's a reminder. It's a reminder and it points us back to the cross and reminds us that we're saved by grace through faith, not by what we've done. And it keeps us humble if we let it. So I'm going to read the, our text of this morning. You can follow along. 1 Corinthians 6, as I do it, keep your ear tuned for a phrase that repeats six times. Uh, I'm, I'm going to read it out of the New Living Translation because in it the phrase is so clear. And there are also three idioms, three popular saying or phrases that are a little bit less clear, but see if you can pick them out. And these idioms and phrases are from the Corinthian culture and have played a major role in directing their thoughts and thus the actions of these Christians into self-destructive, just a mess of quarrels and divisions and all kinds of wrong living. So just as I read, follow along and listen and see if you can hear this phrase that is repeated six times and then three idioms. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. When one of you has a dispute with another believer, how dare you file a lawsuit and ask, and ask a secular court to decide the matter instead of taking it to other believers? Don't you realize that someday we believers will judge the world? And since you're going to judge the world, can't you even decide these little things among yourselves? Don't you realize that we will judge angels? So surely you should be able to resolve ordinary disputes in this life. If you have legal disputes about such matters, why go to outside judges who are not respected by the church? I'm saying this to shame you. Isn't there anyone in all the church who is wise enough to decide these issues? But instead, one believer sues another right in front of unbelievers. Even to have such lawsuits with one another is a defeat for you. Why not just accept the injustice and leave it at that? Why not let yourselves be cheated? Instead, you yourselves are the one who do wrong and cheat even your fellow believers. Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or those who worship idols or commit adultery or who are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves or greedy people or drunkards or are abusive or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Some of you were once like that. But you were cleansed. You were made holy. You were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not, ev but not everything is good for you. And, the, in, and even though I'm allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. You say, food was made for the stomach and the stomach for food. This is true, though someday God will do away with both of them. But you can't say that our bodies were made for sexual immorality. They were made for the Lord. And the Lord cares about our bodies. And the Lord will raise us up from the dead by his power, just as he raised our Lord from the dead. Don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? Should a man take his body, which is part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? Never! Don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her? For the scriptures say, the two are united into one. But the person who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Run from sexual sin. Every sin a person commits is outside the body. Sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you? and was given to you by God. You do not belong to yourself. For God bought you with a high price. And so you must honor God with your body. The word of the Lord. Don't you realize? Don't you realize? Another version says, Do you not know? Six times in 20 verses. Like Paul was trying to make a point. Something. Don't you realize? You should know this. Have you forgotten? Can't you just, can you hear the pleading in his voice? The passion, the heartfelt longing of this apostle for his Corinthian friends, those he had led to the, led the faith in Jesus just a few years before. 
Have you ever pleaded with a friend or a brother or sister or a child to remember who they are in Christ? Have you ever pleaded with someone you led to Christ just to remember that they're born again, this is who you are? Have you ever pleaded with someone to say, this is what Jesus saved you from. Don't go back there. Jesus saved you from that. He brought you out of that. To plead with someone to remember what Jesus has saved them to. And so Paul is pleading with his spiritual children, those who he had led to faith only a few short years previously. He wants them to open their eyes and to recognize some fundamental truths that would bring them freedom and would bring them purpose and unity. Don't you realize, Paul says again and again, the first thing that he wanted them to realize was that you are saved for greater things than just your own benefit. We have a great salvation. Paul says you're saved for greater things than just going to heaven, just escaping hell. He said, don't you realize that someday we're going to judge the world? Don't you realize that believers are going to judge angels? Paul says, it's just embarrassing that you guys take each other to court and judge each other in front of unbelievers. Apparently in the Corinthian culture of the day, everybody, that's what they did. They took each other to the court. It was so common, it was almost recreation. Like you'd bring a charge against someone, you go to court. Everybody sat on jury duty, and this is what they talked about. It was kind of like sports, I guess. And they talked about these different judgments, and they were so proud of themselves, and so valued their own opinion. They thought they had the corner on wisdom, and they talked about their decisions and these judgments, and their opinions, they thought they were so intellectually superior to everyone else. Paul says, not so. Paul already told them that the world's wisdom is foolishness in God's kingdom. He says, the world's idea of wisdom couldn't comprehend spiritual truth anyway. Paul tells them now that, he said, don't you know that as believers, as saints, as disciples of Jesus, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, you've got a high calling. When we get to heaven, we're not going to be floating around on clouds, playing harps and eating Philly cheese. We've got stuff to do. We're going to rule and reign with Him. We have responsibility. I don't know what it looks like exactly, but there's purpose. We're being prepared here for heavenly responsibility. Think of the parable of the talents. Somehow, in some capacity, we've got responsibility in heaven helping God rule His kingdom. We're going to play an active role in making decisions and, and doing work and being creative and all these kinds of things. We'll have purpose and it will be more clear and more wonderful than it is now. Paul tells them in no uncertain terms that they're being prepared and equipped to judge these things in heaven. He said, if that's your calling, which it is, why is it you can't even judge these small things, incidental things down here? He says, come on, don't you realize what you're called to here? Shouldn't we be able to make decisions and evaluate matters and weigh things out here on earth? He says, not so much right here, but he says, other places, you have the Holy Spirit who guides you into all truth. James writes, and we know this, he says, if you want wisdom, you ask God, and He will give to you abundantly. We have no excuse. We're to go about this life with wisdom. We're to look at ourselves and others and situations from God's perspective. And we're to make wise decisions and sound decisions and good decisions. 
It's practice. Paul says in so many words, you've been saved for this. You've been saved for this, to, to have wisdom and to make good evaluations and judgment. He says, you're, you're just embarrassing yourself and the church and Christ by taking these matters, which you are fully capable of dealing with, to the courts, just to impress others with your intellectual ability and your oratory skills. When you do this, you want to lift yourself up by putting someone else down. This is not the way of Christ. The way of Christ is much, much bigger than this. The way of Christ and what you've been saved, what you've been saved for, is much bigger than this. You're, you're saved for greater things, un, unimaginable things, things we can't even describe here. And don't you realize you're going to judge the world. You're going to judge angels. You, you have access to wisdom to make these decisions. Use it. Paul encourages them. He says, you're saved for greater things than just going to heaven, just being saved. We're saved to do some incredible things the privilege of ruling and reigning with God and his kingdom. Just open your eyes up a little bit. Look up. In the kingdom of God, the way up is to go down. Humble ourselves that we may be exalted one day. The way of Christ is to do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God, Micah writes. We're saved for greater things than just our own benefit. You know, the gospel isn't just about us. The gospel just isn't about us. It's bigger than us. We get splashed in the overflow of God's love. But it's bigger than just us. Paul says, open your eyes. You're being prepared for heaven. Unimaginable things. Unimaginable responsibility and glory and delight to rule and reign with God. We're saved for greater things, Paul says. Open up your eyes. Don't you know? Paul also says that we are saved from sin. We're saved from something. We're saved to something. Sometimes we forget that, don't we? We just think we're saved from something. But we're saved to something. We're saved from sin and hell and destruction and all that. We're saved to holy living and righteousness to glorify God. This is what we're saved to. We're saved from sin to holy living. Paul asked him a third time, Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? He says, Don't fool yourself. Don't kid yourself. Paul says that what we do and how we live and the choices we make every day matter. They matter a lot. Paul is speaking here not of an individual choice, but of a pattern, a lifestyle. For what we do, how we live, is a very good indicator of what we believe, what we hold to be true. If we say that we love God, but we live to satisfy our own desires, to indulge our own wants, to lift ourselves up, what we believe is really self-evident. We love ourselves, not God. Paul says that a lifestyle of wicked living, and he describes it, of sinful living, of self-indulgent living, isn't congruent with being a Christian. Can't do it. Paul says, you guys were like that. But God saved you. It says, before, you were like these people. These Corinthian Christians, they were wicked people. And you can read some of the offenses there. They were sexually immoral. immoral. They were idol worshippers. They were perverse. They were thieves. They were greedy. They were drunks. 
being a Corinthian is kind of a praise for being a drunk. They were abusive. They were cheats. Paul says, you guys were like this. You once were. But God saved you from that. Because they once lived for themselves. To try and please and satisfy whatever appetite they wanted. If they were hungry, they ate to excess. If they, if they were thirsty, they drank to, ex, to excess. If they had a sexual appetite, they fulfilled it in however, whichever way they wanted. You were once like that. Paul says, when they called on the name of Jesus to save them, when they recognized their sinfulness, that God accepted them. He made them holy. He cleaned them washed them, made them right with him because of what Jesus had done on the cross. Paul says as a Christian, we need to remember that. We need to remember what we were saved from so we don't fall back into it. And we need to remember what we're saved to. We're saved to holy living. Paul says as a Christian, you live not for yourself, not like the world does. There's a difference. As a Christian, you live for Jesus. Paul says, don't kid yourself. Don't fool yourself. Don't be deceived by these phrases that keep repeating in your head. He said, you were saved from sin. Don't get tangled up in it. Familiar words in Hebrews. Get rid of the sin that so easily entangles and ensnares us. And run with endurance the race set before us. We're saved for holy living. We're saved to honor the one who saved us. We're saved from something, we're saved to something. As we read, continue on reading through the chapter, Paul makes another point. He says, we're saved, we're saved wholly, body and spirit together. We're, we're saved entirely. We're saved, we're wholly saved. And, he, and this is where he corrects some thinking. There's some Corinthianisms that have been causing problems and leading them astray. In verse 12, says it twice. The Corinthianism was, I'm allowed to do anything. I can do anything. All things are permissible for me as a Christian. These are Christians that were saying that. And it was a Corinthian phrase. So we can do anything. There's no limit. All things are permissible. In verse 13, there's another Corinthianism that says, food for the stomach and stomach for food. It says, like if I've got an appetite, I can fulfill it. That's the way it's, I'm made. If I'm hungry, I eat. And they used it, used that phrase to say, well, if I have a sexual urge or an impulse or want, I can fulfill it. No problem. They were being led astray. Food for the stomach and stomach for food. They were using that principle of Corinthianism to lead them astray in other areas. Verse 18. It's, it's not quite as clear. But it makes sense when we think about it. The NIV reads, All other sins a man commits are outside his body. But I was studying this through, and the, the Net Bible, which is a Bible that focuses mostly on translation, doesn't comment on meaning so much, but just on translations, it says there's a really good case that there is another Corinthianism here, another phrase, another cliche, another idiom that the Corinthian Christians were using to excuse their behavior, or to give them license. And the, the Net Bible, and I think this is accurate, there was a saying that every sin a person commits is outside the body. We sin, it's, it's outside us. It doesn't affect us. It's outside of us. And this makes sense in the way they were thinking, because in the Corinthian thinking, is that there is a separation between the spiritual and the physical. Spiritual is good. Physical, not so good. 
So either they went very aesthetic, I think that's the word, where they just suppressed all their appetites and, you know, very basic, no luxury, anything like that. Or they said, well, it doesn't matter. Spirit and flesh and body are, are apart. One doesn't influence the other. So I can give in to all these physical appetites and I'm doesn't affect what I believe. Doesn't affect, affect my spirituality. There's a disconnect. I said, well, any sin is outside the body. So it doesn't affect you. A little warped, but very effective in giving them license to do whatever they wanted. The Corinthians were being misled by these idioms, by these figures of speech this wisdom of the day. They were saying, in effect, if you look at all three of them, it said it doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't affect our spirituality because salvation is a spiritual thing. The physical world is irrelevant to the spiritual. And if you believe that, then how you live is irrelevant to what you believe. By thinking this way then, they could engage in any activity they wanted to. They could fulfill any appetite they wanted to by any means. If they were hungry, they could eat however much. If they were thirsty, they could drink however much. If they had a sexual urge, they could engage in whatever sexual activity they fancied. Because it didn't affect their spiritual reality. They were thinking wrong. They were being led astray sin to them was an abstract reality. Paul says an emphatic no, this is wrong. Three times. He says these cliches are wrong. These idioms are wrong. This wisdom, quote unquote, from the world is wrong. They're misleading, they're junk. He says, don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ. Ha! There is a cohesiveness. There is a unity between body and spirit. He says, don't you realize? And he addresses sexual immorality and says, if you go be with a prostitute, you're one with her. There is implications. He says, don't you realize that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God. He draws this together and says, you're saved holy, body and spirit. These are connected. You're saved as a whole person. The Corinthians had forgotten, they'd been misled by the wisdom of the world into thinking that there was a separation between the spiritual and the physical. They thought that what we believe is somehow separate from what we do. The thing is, there's nothing new under the sun, and there's people that believe that today. There's people today that say, I can believe in, yeah, I believe in God, absolutely. And then live however. Yeah, I prayed a prayer, I said the words. I got confirmed or baptized, I'm good. I live however I want. They've got hell insurance. They've agreed intellectually. That's all that matters. They're in. Paul says, no way. He says, that's crazy. That's wrong. He says, Jesus bought your freedom. Jesus bought your forgiveness. He bought your salvation with his physical blood. He was on the cross. He lived here on the earth. He walked here as a man among us. He lived an obedient life. He went to the cross. He suffered physically and emotionally and spiritually for your sin. He died physically in an excruciating death. Crucifixion on the cross. He's, Jesus paid physically also for your salvation. This is one. You're saved holy, body and spirit. And Paul says all kinds of sin not just sexual immorality. 
Not just sexual sin. He says all sin, all sin affects our whole being. Whether it's sexual sin, whether it's greed, whether it's theft, whether it's drunkenness, and he lists them in this chapter. Or cheating, or holding something or someone in a position where God should be, idolatry. He says all kinds of sin affects you. Your whole body. Your whole person. And we know that sin affects us physically and spiritually. It affects our whole being. Doesn't it? Anger affects our whole being. It affects our relationships. It affects how we think. Unforgiveness, malice, jealousy, envy, drunkenness. All these affect our whole being. Paul says, you're saved holy, body and spirit. He says, the Holy Spirit lives within you. He says, you belong to God. You are the temple of God. You are where God lives. This is a profound thing. He says, you are where God lives. Individually, as believers, and corporately as the church. We are the body of Christ. This is a mystery. But it is the truth. And he says, you are holy. God made you holy. When he saved you, be holy. There is to be a congruency between what we say we believe and what we assent to intellectually, what we agree with, and what we do. There needs to be congruency there. The great truth of the gospel. The great truth of the gospel is that we who are saved, we belong to God. We belong. We're His. And it's not like a club where you have to perform or agree and do, keep the rules, and then you belong. It's like a family where you are, <laughs> you belong, and then you fulfill your responsibilities because you're part of the family. Completely opposite. Paul writes, you've been made holy, through Christ's work on the cross. He says, now be holy. This is a convicting thing. But it is a precious thing. Because we belong. We are His. Not because of anything we've done. Not None of that. But it's because of what Jesus has done on the cross. You do not belong to yourself, Paul writes, for God bought you with a high price. He paid the price. So you must honor God with your body. We don't belong to ourselves, we belong to him, body and soul. And it is right, it is right that we should live to glorify him. Paul addresses some very difficult issues here, some very explicit things in this chapter and he wants the believers to remember some things three things he wants them to remember and we need to remember this too he says we've been saved for greater things not just our own benefit the gospel is great we've been saved from sin to holiness and we've been saved holy in body and spirit and so it is right then that we should live to honor and to glorify and to love and to enjoy the God who has saved us.